Chapter 75 of The Death Shot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Death Shot by Thomas Maine Reed chapter seventy five a transformation night has spread its sable pall over the desert plain darker in the deep chasm through which runs coyote creek there is light enough in the encampment of the prairie pirates for the great fire kindled for cooking their dinners still burns a constant supply of resinous pine knots keeping up the blaze which illuminates a large circle around by its side nearly a score of men are seated in groups some playing cards others idly carousing no one would suppose them the same scene there but a few hours before since there is not a semblance of indian among them instead they are all white men and wearing the garb of civilization though scarce two are costumed alike there are coats of kentucky jeans of home wove copper stripe of blanket cloth in the three colors red blue and green there are blouses of brown linen and buckskin dyed with dogwood ooze there are creole jackets of atacapas cottonade and mexican ones of cotton velveteen alike varied is the head leg and footwear there are hats of every shape and pattern pantaloons of many a cut and material most of them tucked into boots with legs of different lengths from ankle to mid thigh only in the undergarments is there anything like uniformity nine out of the ten wearing shirts of scarlet flannel the fashion of the frontier a stranger entering the camp now would suppose its occupants to be a party of hunters one acquainted with the customs of southwestern texas might pronounce them mustangers men who make their living by the taking and taming of wild horses and if those around the fire were questioned about their calling such would be the answer in their tents are all the paraphernalia used in this pursuit lassoes for catching the horses halters and hobbles for confining them bits for breaking and the like while close by is a corral in which to keep the animals when caught all counterfeit there is not a real mustanger among these men nor one who is not a robber scarce one who could lay his hands upon his heart and say he has not some time or other in his life committed murder for though changed in appearance since last seen they are the same who entered the camp laden with louis de pre's money fresh from the massacre of his slaves the transformation took place soon as they snatched a hasty meal they all hurried down to the creek provided with pieces of soap and plunging in washed the paint from their hands arms and faces the indian costume has not only been cast aside but secreted with all its equipment if the encampment were searched now no stained feathers would be found no heads or belts of wampum no beech clouts bows or quivers no tomahawks or spears all have been catched in a cave among the rocks there to remain till needed for some future maraud or massacre around their campfires the freebooters are in full tide of enjoyment the dollars have been divided and each has his thousands those at the cards are not contented they are craving more they will be richer or poorer and soon playing poker at fifty dollars an ante gamesters and lookers-on alike smoke drink and make merry they have no fear now not the slightest apprehension if pursued the pursuers cannot find the way to coyote creek if they did 
what would they see there certainly not the red-skinned savages who plundered the san saba mission but a party of innocent horse hunters all texans the only one resembling an indian among them is the half-breed ferdinand but he is also so metamorphosed that his late master could not recognize him the others have changed from red men to white in reverse he has become to all appearance a pure-blood aboriginal confident in their security because ignorant of what has taken place under the live oak they little dream that one of their confederates is in a situation where he will be forced to tell a tale sure to thwart their well-constructed scheme casting it down as a house of cards equally are they unaware of the revelation which their own prisoner the mulatto could make they suppose him and his master to be but two travellers encountered by accident having no connection with the san saba settlers berlassi is better informed about this though not knowing all he believes clancy to have been en route for the new settlement but without having reached it he will never reach it now in hope of getting a clear insight into many things still clouded while his followers are engaged at their games he seeks the tent to which jupiter has been consigned and where he is now under the surveillance of the half-blood ferdinand ordering the mestizo to retire he puts the prisoner through a course of cross-questioning the mulatto is a man of no ordinary intelligence he has the misfortune to be born a slave with the blood of a free man in his veins which stirring him to discontent with his ignoble lot at length forced him to become a fugitive with the subtlety partly instinctive but strengthened by many an act of injustice he divines the object of the robber's captain's visit not much does the latter make of him question as he may jupe knows nothing of any phil quantrell or any richard darkey he is the slave of a young gentleman who has been separated from him he makes no attempt to conceal his master's name knowing that burlassi is already acquainted with clancy and must have recognized him they were on their way to join the colony of colonel armstrong with a party from the states they came up from the colorado the night before camping in the san saba bottom where he believes them to be still early in the morning his master left the camp for a hunt and the hound had tracked a bear up the gully that was why they were on the upper plain they were trying for the track of the bear when taken the mulatto has no great liking for his master for whom he has had many a severe flogging in proof he tells the robber chief to turn up his shirt and see how his back has been scored by the cowhide borlassi does so and sure enough there are scars somewhat similar to those he carries himself if not pity the sight begets a sort of coarse sympathy such as the convict feels for his fellow an emotion due to the freemasonry of crime jupiter takes care to strengthen it by harping on the cruelty of his master more than hinting that he would like to leave him if any other would buy him indeed he'd be willing to run away if he saw the chance don't trouble yourself about that says the bandit as the interview comes near its end maybe i'll buy ye myself at all events mr clancy ain't likely to flog you any more how'd you like me for your master i'd be right glad boss are ye up to taking care of horses that's just what master clancy kept me for well he's gone on to the settlement without you as he left you behind that careless way you can stay with us and look after my horse it's the same you've been accustomed to i swapped with your master fore we parted company 
Jupe is aware that Clancy's splendid steed is in the camp. Through a chink in the tent he saw the horse ridden in, Barlassie on his back, wondering why his master was not along, and what they had done with him. He had no faith in the tale told him, but a fear it is far from otherwise. It will not do to show this, and concealing his anxiety, he rejoins, All right, Massa, I'll do my best. Only hope you don't gwin where we come across Master Clancy. If he sees me, he'll sure want me back, and then I'll get the cowhide right smart. He'll flog me dreadful. You're in no danger. I'll take care he never sets eye on you again. Here, Nandy, he says to the Metzizo, summoned back. You can remove them ropes from your prisoner. Give him something to eat and drink. Treat him as ye would one of ourselves. He is to be that from this time forward. Spread a buffer skin and give him a bit of blanket for his bed. Same time, for safety's sake, keep an eye on him. The caution is spoken sotto voice, so that the prisoner may not hear it. After which Borlassie leaves the two together, congratulating himself on the good speculation he will make, not by keeping Jupe to groom his horse, but selling him as a slave to the first man willing to purchase him. In the fine able-bodied mulatto he sees a thousand dollars cash, soon as he can come across a cotton planter. End of chapter 75Chapter 76 of The Death Shot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Death Shot by Thomas Maine Reed. 76. Mestizo and Mulatto. While the chief has been interrogating his prisoner, the robbers around the fire have gone on with their poker playing and whiskey drinking. More or less, Joining in the debauch, orders brandy to be brought out of his tent and distributed freely around. He drinks deeply himself, in part to celebrate the occasion of such a grand stroke of business done, but as much to drown his disappointment at the captives not yet having come in. The alcohol has its effect, and ere long rekindles a hope which Chisholm strengthens, saying, All yet will be well, and the missing ones turn up, if not that night, on the morrow. Somewhat relieved by this expectation, Borlas enters into the spirit of the hour and becomes jovial and boisterous as any of his subordinates. The cards are tossed aside, the play abandoned. Instead, coarse stories are told, and songs sung fit only for the ears of such a godforsaken crew. The Saturnalia is brought to a close when all become so intoxicated they can neither tell story nor sing song. Then some stagger to their tents, others dropping over where they sit and falling fast asleep. By midnight there is not a man among them awake and the camp is silent, save here and there for a drunken snore disturbing its stillness. The great central fire, around which some remain lying astretch, burns on, but no longer blazes. There is no one to tend it with the pitchy pine knots. Inside the tents, also, the lights are extinguished, all except one. This, the rude skin shielding, which shelters the mestizo and mulatto. The two half-bloods, of different strain, are yet awake and sitting up. They are also drinking, hobnobbing with one another. Fernand has supplied the liquor freely and without stint. Pretending to fraternize with the new confederate, he has filled the latter's glass at least a half score of times, doing the same with his own. Both have emptied them with like rapidity, and yet neither seems at all overcome. Each thinks the other the hardest case at a drinking bout he has ever come across, wondering he is not dead drunk, though knowing why he is himself sober. The Spanish moss plucked from the adjacent trees and littering the tent floor could tell if it had the power of speech. Jupiter has had many a whiskey spree in the woods of Mississippi, but never has he encountered a convive who could stand so much of it and still keep his tongue and seat. What can it mean? Is the mestizo's stomach made of steel? While perplexed and despairing of being able to get Fernand intoxicated, an explanation suggests itself. His fellow tippler may be shamming as himself. Pretending to look out of the tent, he twists his eyes away so far that, from the front, little else than their whites can be seen, 
but enough of the retina is uncovered to receive an impression from behind, this showing the mestizo tilting his cup and spilling its contents among the moss. He now knows he is being watched as well as guarded, and of his vigilant sentinel there seems but one way to disembarrass himself. As the thought of it flits across his brain, his eyes flash with a feverish light, such as when one intends attacking by stealth and with a determination to kill, for he must either kill the man by his side, or give up what is to himself worth more than such a life, his own liberty. It may be his beloved master yet lives, and there's a chance to succor him. If dead, he will find his body and give it burial. He remembers the promise that morning mutually declared between them, to stand and fall together. He will keep his part of it. If Clancy has fallen, others will go down, too. In the end, if need be, himself. But not till he has taken, or tried to take, a terrible and bloody vengeance. To this he has bound himself by an oath sworn in the secret recesses of his heart. Its prelude is nigh, and the death of the Indian half-breed is to initiate it. For the fugitive slave knows the part this vile caitiff has played, and will not scruple to kill him, the less it is now an inexorable necessity. He but waits for the opportunity, has been seeking it for some time. It offers at length. Turning suddenly, and detecting the mestizo in his act of deception, he asks laughingly why he should practice such a trick. Then, stooping forward, as if to verify it, his right arm is seen to lunge out with something that glitters in his hand. It is the blade of a bowie knife. In an instant the arm is drawn back, the glittering gone off the blade, obliterated by blood. For it has been between the ribs and through the heart of the mestizo, who, slipping from his seat, falls to the floor without even a groan. Grasping Clancy's gun, which chances to be in the tent, and then blowing out the light, the mulatto moves off, leaving but a dead body behind him. Once outside, he looks cautiously around the encampment, scanning the tents and the ground adjacent to them. He sees the big fire still red, but not flaming. He can make out the forms of men lying around it, all of them, for him fortunately, asleep. Stepping as if on eggs, and keeping as much as possible in shadow, he threads his way through the tents until he is quite clear of the encampment, but he does not go directly off. Instead, he makes a circuit to the other side where Brassford is tied to a tree. A cut of his red blade releases the hound that follows him in silence, as if knowing it necessary. Then on to the corral where the horses are penned up. Arriving at the fence, he finds the bars, and there stopping, speaks some words in undertone, but loud enough to be heard by the animals inside. As if it were a cabalistic speech, one separates from the rest and comes towards him. It is the steed of Clancy. Protruding its soft muzzle over the rail, it is stroked by the mulatto's hand, which soon after has hold of the forelock. Fortunately, the saddles are close by, astride the fence, with the bridles hanging to the branches of a tree. Jupiter easily recognizes those he is in search of, and soon has the horse comparisoned. At length he leads the animal, not mounting till he is well away from the camp. Then, climbing cautiously into the saddle, he continues on, Brassford after, man, horse, and hound, making no more noise than if all three were but shadows. End of 76 Chapter 77 of The Death Shot This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn The Death Shot by Thomas Main Reed, 77, A Strayed Traveler. Pale, trembling, with teeth chattering, Richard Dark awakes from his drunken slumber. He sees his horse tied to the tree as he left him, but making violent efforts to get loose, for coyotes have come skulking around the copse, and their cry agitates the animal. It is this that has awakened the sleeper. He starts to his feet in fear, though not of the wolves. Their proximity has naught to do with the shudder which passes through his frame. It comes from an apprehension he has overslept himself, and that, meanwhile, his confederates have passed the place. It is broad daylight, with a bright sun in the sky, though this he cannot see through the thick foliage intervening. But his watch will tell him the time. He takes it out and glances at the dial. The hands appear not to move. He holds it to his ear, but hears no ticking. Now he remembers having neglected to wind it the night before. It is run down. Hastily returning it to his pocket, he makes for open ground, where he may get a view of the sun. By its height above the horizon, 
as far as he can judge, it should be about nine of the morning. This point, as he supposes settled, does not remove his apprehension, on the contrary, but increases it. The returning marauders would not likely be delayed so late. In all probability they have passed. How is he to be assured? A thought strikes him. He will step out upon the plain and see if he can discern their tracks. He does so, keeping on to the summit of the pass. There he finds evidence to confirm his fears. The loose turf around the head of the gorge is torn and trampled by the hoofs of many horses, all going off over the plain. The robbers have returned to their rendezvous. Hastening back to his horse, he prepares to start after. Leading the animal to the edge of the copse, he is confronted by what sends a fresh thrill of fear through his heart. The sun is before his face, but not as when he looked at it. Instead of having risen higher, it is now nearer the horizon. Great God! he exclaims as the truth breaks upon him. It's satin, not rising. Evening instead of morning. Shading his eye with his spread palm, he gazes at the golden orb in look bewildered. Not long till assured the sun is sinking in night nigh. The deduction drawn is full of sinister sequence. More than one starts up in his mind to dismay him. He is little acquainted with the trail to Coyote Creek and may be unable to find it. Moreover, the robbers are certain to have been pursued, and Syme Woodley will be one of the pursuers. Bosley forced to conduct them as far as he can. The outraged settlers may at any time appear coming up the pass. He glances apprehensively toward it, then across the plain. His face is now towards the sun, whose lower limb just touches the horizon, the red round orb appearing across the smooth surface as over that of a tranquil sea. He regards it to direct his course. He knows that the camping place on Coyote Creek is due west from where he is, and at length, having resolved, he sets his foot in the stirrup, vaults into the saddle, and spurs off, leaving the blackjack grove behind him. He does not proceed far before becoming uncertain as to his course. The sun goes down, leaving heaven's firmament in darkness, with only some last lingering rays along the western edge. These grow fainter and fainter, till scarce any difference can be noted around the horizon's ring. He now rides in doubt, guessing the direction. Scanning the stars, he searches for the polar constellation, but a mist has meanwhile sprung up over the plain, and creeping across the northern sky, concealed it. In the midst of his perplexity, the moon appears, and taking bearings by this, he once more makes westward. But there are cumulus clouds in the sky, and these, ever and anon drifting over the moon's disk, compel him to pull up till they pass. At length he is favored with a prolonged interval of light, during which he puts his animal to its best speed, and advances many miles in what he supposes to be the right direction. As yet he has encountered no living creature, no object of any kind. He is in hopes to get sight of the solitary tree, for beyond it the trail to Coyote Creek is easily taken. While scanning the moonlight expanse, he decries a group of figures, apparently quadrupeds, though of what species he cannot tell. They appear too large for wolves, and yet are not like wild horses, deer, or buffaloes. On drawing nearer, he discovers them to be but coyotes, the film refracting the moon's light, having deceived him as to their size. What can they be doing out there? Perhaps collected around some animal they have hunted down and killed? Possibly a pronghorn antelope? It's not with any purpose that he approaches them. He only does so because they are in the line of his route. But before reaching the spot where they are assembled, he sees something to excite his curiosity, at the same time baffling all conjecture what it can be. On his coming closer, the jackals scatter apart, exposing it to view, then loping off, leaving it behind them. Whatever it be, it is evidently the lure that has brought the predatory beasts together. It is not the dead body of deer, antelope, or animal of any kind, but a thing of rounded shape set upon a short shank or stem. What the devil is it? he asks himself, first pausing, then spurring on towards it. Looks for all the world like a man's head. At that moment, the moon emitting one of its brightest beams shows the object still clearer, causing him to add an exclamation. By heavens, it is a head. Another instant, and he sees a face which sends the blood back to his heart, almost freezing it in his veins. Horror-stricken, he reins up, dragging his horse upon the haunches, and in that attitude remains, his eyes rolling as though they would start from their sockets. Then, shouting the words, Great God! Clancy! Followed by a wild shriek, he wrenches the horse around and mechanically spurs into desperate speed. In his headlong flight he hears a cry, which comes as from out of the earth. 
his own name pronounced, and after it the word, Murderer. End of 77. Chapter 78 of The Death Shot This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn The Death Shot by Thomas Main Reed 78. Hours of Agony Out of the earth literally rose that cry, so affrighting Richard Dark, since it came from Charles Clancy. Throughout the livelong day, on to the mid-hours of night has he been enduring agony unspeakable, alone, with but the companionship of hostile creatures, wolves that threatened to gnaw the skin from his skull, and vultures ready to tear his eyes out of his sockets. Why has he not gone mad? There are moments when it comes too near this, when his reason is well-nigh unseated, but manfully he struggles against it, thoughtfully with reliance on him, whose name he has repeated and prayerfully invoked. And God, in his mercy, sends something to sustain him, a remembrance. In his most despairing hour he recalls one circumstance seeming favorable, and which in the confusion of thought, consequent on such a succession of scenes, had escaped him. He now remembers the other man found along with Dark under the live oak. Bosley will be able to guide a pursuing party, and with Woodley controlling will be forced to do it. He can lead them direct to the rendezvous of the robbers, where Clancy can have no fear but that they will settle things satisfactorily. There, learning what has been done to himself, they would lose no time in coming after him. This train of conjecture, rational enough, restores his hopes, and again he believes there is a chance of his receiving succor. About time is he chiefly apprehensive. They may come too late. He will do all he can to keep up, hold out as long as life itself may last. So resolved, he makes renewed efforts to fight off the wolves and frighten the vultures. Fortunately for him, the former are but coyotes, the latter turkey buzzards, both cowardly creatures, timid as hares, except when the quarry is helpless. They must not know he is this. And to deceive them, he shakes his head, rolls his eyes, and shouts at the highest pitch of his voice, but only at intervals, when they appear too threateningly near. He knows the necessity of economizing his cries and gestures. By too frequent repetition, they might cease to avail him. Throughout the day he has the double enemy to deal with, but night disembarrasses him of the birds, leaving only the beasts. He derives little benefit from the change. For the coyotes, but jackals in daylight, at night become wolves, emboldened by the darkness. Besides, they have been too long gazing at this strange thing, and listening to the shouts which have proceeded from it, without receiving hurt or harm, to fear it as before. The time has come for attack. Blending their unearthly notes into one grand chorus, they close around, finally resolve to assault it. And, again, Clancy calls upon God, upon heaven, to help him. His prayer is heard, for what he sees seems an answer to it. The moon is low down, her disk directly before his face, and upon the plain between a shadow is projected, reaching to his chin. At the same time, he sees what is making it, a man upon horseback. Simultaneously, he hears a sound, the trampling of hoofs upon the hard turf. The coyotes, catching it too, are scared, changing from their attitude of attack and dropping tails to the ground. As the shadow darkening over them tells that the horseman is drawing nigh, they scatter off in retreat. Clancy utters an ejaculation of joy. He's about to hail the approaching Norseman when a doubt restrains him. Who can it be? he asks himself with mingled hope and apprehension. Woodley would not be coming in that way alone. If not some of the settlers, at least Haywood would be along with him. Besides, there is scarce time for them to have reached the mission and returned. It cannot be either. Jupiter? Has he escaped from the custody of the outlawed crew? Clancy is accustomed to seeing the mulatto upon a mule. This man rides a horse, and otherwise looks not like Jupiter. It is not he. Who, then? During all this time, the horseman is drawing nearer, though slowly. When first heard, the tramp told him to be going at a gallop. But he has slackened speed, and now makes approach, apparently with caution, as if reconnoitering. He has decried the jackals, and comes to see what they are gathered about. These having retreated, Clancy can perceive that the eyes of the stranger are fixed upon his own head, and that he is evidently puzzled to make out what it is. 
For a moment the man makes a stop, then moves on, coming closer and closer. With the moon behind his back, his face is in shadow and cannot be seen by Clancy, but it is not needed for his identification. The dress and figure are sufficient. Cut sharply against the sky is the figure of a plumed savage. A sham one, Clancy knows, with a thrill of fresh despair, recognizing Richard Dark. It will soon be all over with him now. In another instant his hopes, doubts, fears will be alike ended with his life. He has no thought but that Dark, since last seen, has been in communication with Borlas, and from him, learning all, has returned for the life he failed to take before. Meanwhile, the plumed horseman continues to approach, till within less than a length of his horse. Then, drawing bridle with a jerk, suddenly comes to a stop. Clancy can see that he is struck with astonishment. His features, now near enough to be distinguished, wearing a bewildered look. Then hears his own name called out, a shriek succeeding. The horse wheeled round and away, as if Satan had hold of his tail. For a long time is heard the tramp of the retreating horse going in full fast gallop, gradually less distinct, at length dying away in the distance. End of 78 Chapter 79 of The Death Shot This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn The Death Shot by Thomas Maine Reed 79. An Unexpected Visitor To Clancy there is nothing strange in Dark's sudden and terrified departure. With the quickness of thought itself, he comprehends its cause. In their encounter under the live oak, in shadow and silence, his old rival has not recognized him. Nor can he since have seen Borlas, or any of the band. Why is he behind them? Clancy cannot surmise, though he has a suspicion of the truth. Certainly, Dark came there not by design, but only chance conducted. Had it been otherwise, he would not have gone off in such wild affright. All this Clancy intuitively perceives, on the instant of his turning to retreat. And, partly to make this more sure, though also stirred by indignation he cannot restrain, he sends forth that shout, causing the scared wretch to flee faster and further. Now that he has gone, Clancy is again left to his reflections, but little less gloomy than before. From only one does he derive satisfaction. The robber chief must have lied. Helen Armstrong has not been in the arms of Richard Dark. He may hope she has reached her home in safety. All else is as ever, and soon likely to be worse, for he feels as one who has only had a respite, believing it will be but short. Dark will soon recover from his scare, for he will now go to the rendezvous, and there, getting an explanation of what has caused it, come back to glut his delayed vengeance, more terrible from long accumulation. Will the wolves wait for him? Ha! There they are again! So exclaims the wretched man, as he sees them once more making approach. And now they draw nigh with increased audacity, their ravenous instincts but strengthened by the check. The enemy late dreaded has not molested them, but gone off, leaving their prey unprotected. They are again free to assail, and this time will surely devour it. Once more their melancholy whine breaks the stillness of the night, as they come loping up one after another. Soon all are reassembled around the strange thing, which through their fears has long defied them. More familiar, they fear it less now. Renewing their hostile demonstration, they circle about it, gliding from side to side in sachet crasse, as through the mazes of a cotillion. With forms magnified under the moonlight, they look like werewolves dancing around a death's head, their long-drawn lugubrious wails making appropriate music to the measure. Horror for him who hears, hearing it without hope. Of this, not a ray left now, its last lingering spark extinguished, and before him but the darkness of death in all its dread certainty, a death horrible, appalling. Putting forth all his moral strength, exerting it to the utmost, he tries to resign himself to the inevitable. In vain. Life is too sweet to be so surrendered. He cannot calmly resign it, and again instinctively makes an effort to fright off his hideous assailants. 
his eyes rolling, scintillating in their sockets, his lips moving, his cries sent from between them, are all to no purpose now. The coyotes come nearer and nearer. They are within three feet of his face. He can see their wolfish eyes, the white serrature of their teeth, the red panting tongues, can feel their fetid breath blown against his brow. Their jaws are agape. Each instant he expects them to close around his skull. Why did he shout, sending Dark away? He regrets having done it. Better his head to have been crushed or cleft by a tomahawk, killing him at once, than torn while still alive, gnawed, mumbled over, by those frightful fangs threatening so near. The thought stifles reflection. It is of itself excruciating torture. He cannot bear it much longer. No man could, however strong, however firm his faith in the Almighty. Even yet he has not lost this. The teachings of early life, the precepts inculcated by a pious mother, stand him instead now. And though sure he must die, and wants death to come quickly, he nevertheless tries to meet it resignedly, mentally exclaiming, Mother, father, I come. Soon shall I join you. Helen, my love, oh, how I have wronged you in thus throwing my life away. God forgive. His regrets are interrupted, as if by God himself. He has been heard by the all-merciful, the omnipotent, for, seemingly, no other hand could succor him. While the prayerful thoughts are still passing through his mind, the wolves suddenly cease their attack, and he sees them retiring with closed jaws and fallen tails, not hastily, but slow and skulkingly, seeding the ground inch by inch, as though reluctant to leave it. What can it mean? Casting his eyes outward, he sees nothing to explain the behavior of the brutes, nor account for their changed demeanor. He listens, all ears, expecting to hear the hoof-stroke of a horse, the same he late saw reined up in front of him, with Richard Dark upon his back. The ruffian is returning, sooner than anticipated. There is no such sound. Instead, one softer, which, but for the hollow Cretaceous rock underlying the plain and acting as a conductor, would not be conveyed to his ears. It is the pattering as of some animal's paws, going in rapid gait. He cannot imagine what sort of creature it may be. In truth, he has no time to think before hearing the sound close behind his head, the animal approaching from that direction. Soon after he feels a hot breath strike against his brow, with something still warmer touching his cheek. It's the tongue of a dog. Brassfort! Brassfort it is, cowering before his face, filling his ears with a soft whimpering, sweet as any speech ever heard for he has seen the jackals retreat, and knows they will not return. His strong staghound is more than a match for the whole pack of cowardly creatures. As easily as it was scattered, can it destroy them? Clancy's first feeling is one of mingled pleasure and surprise, for he fancies himself succored, released from his earth-bound prison so near to have been his grave. The glad emotion is, alas, short-lived, departing as he perceives it, to be only a fancy, and his perilous situation but little changed or improved. For what can the dog do for him? True, he may keep off the coyotes, but that will not save his life. Death must come all the same. A little later, and in less horrid shape, but it must come. Hunger, thirst, one or both will bring it, surely, if slowly. My brave Brassford, faithful fellow, he says, apostrophizing the hound. You cannot protect me from them. But how have you got here? The question is succeeded by a train of conjecture, as follows. They took the dog with them. I saw one lead him away. They've let him loose, and he has sent it back on the trail? That's it. Oh, if Jupiter but were with him. No fear of their letting him off. No. During all this time, Brasford has continued his caresses, fondling his master's head affectionately as a mother her child. Again Clancy speaks, apostrophizing the animal. Dear old dog, you've but come to see me die. Well, it's something to have you here, like a friend beside the deathbed. And you'll stay with me as long as life holds out, and protect me from those skulking creatures. I know you will. Ah, uh, you won't need to stand sentry long. I feel growing fainter. 
When all's over, you can go. I shall never see her more, but someone may find and take you there. She'll care for you and reward you for this fidelity. The soliloquy is brought to a close by the hound suddenly changing attitude. All at once it has ceased its fond demonstrations and stands as if about to make an attack upon its master's head. Very different the intent. Yielding to a simple canine instinct from the strain of terrier in his blood, it commences scratching up the earth around his neck. For Clancy a fresh surprise, as before, mingled with pleasure. For the hound's instinctive actions show him a chance of getting relieved by means he had never himself thought of. He continues talking to the animal, encouraging it by speeches it can comprehend. On it scrapes, tearing up the clods and casting them in showers behind. Despite the firmness with which the earth is packed, the hound soon makes a hollow around its master's neck, exposing his shoulder, the right one, above the surface. A little more mold removed, and his arm will be free. With that, his whole body can be extricated by himself. Stirred by the pleasant anticipation, he continues speaking encouragement to the dog. But Brassfort needs it not, working away in silence and with determined earnestness, as if knowing that time was an element of success. Clancy begins to congratulate himself on escape, is almost sure of it, when a sound breaks upon his ear, bringing back all his apprehensions. Again, the hoof-stroke of a horse. Richard Dark is returning. Too late, Brasford, says his master, apostrophizing him in speech almost mechanical. Too late your help. Soon you'll see me die. End of 79 Chapter 80 of The Death Shot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Death Shot by Thomas Main Reed. 80. A Resurrectionist. Surely the end has come. So reflects Clancy, as with keen apprehension he listens to the tread of the approaching horseman. For, to a certainty, he approaches, the dull, distant thud of hooves gradually growing more distinct. Nor has he any doubt of it being the same steed late reined up in front of him, the fresh score of whose caulkers are there within a few feet of his face. The direction whence comes the sound is of itself significant, that in which Dark went off. It is he returning, can be no other. Yes, surely his end has come the last hour of his life, and so near being saved. Ten minutes more, and Brasfort would have disinterred him. Turning his eyes downward, he can see the cavity enlarged, and getting larger. For the dog continues to drag out the earth, as if not hearing, or disregarding the hoof-stroke. Already its paws are within a few inches of his elbow. Is it possible for him to wrench out his arm? With it free, he might do something to defend himself, and the great staghound will help him. With hope half resuscitated, he makes an effort to extricate the arm, heaving his shoulder upward. In vain. It is held as in a vice, or the clasp of a giant. There is no alternative. He must submit to his fate. And such a fate. Once more he will see the sole enemy of his life, his mother's murderer, standing triumphant over him, will hear his taunting speeches almost a repetition of the scene under the cypress. And to think that in all his encounters with this man, he has been unsuccessful. Too late, ever too late. The thought is of itself a torture. Strange the slowness with which Dark draws nigh. Can he still be in dread of the unearthly? No, or he would not be there. It may be that, sure of his victim, he but delays the last blow, scheming some new horror before he strike it. The tramp of the horse tells him to be going at a walk, unsteady, too, as if the rider were not certain about the way, but seeking it. Can this be so? Has he not yet seen the head and the hound? The moon must be on his back, since it is behind Clancy's own. It may be that Brasfort, a new figure in the oft-changing tableau, stays his advance. Possibly the unexplained presence of the animal has given him a surprise, and hence he approaches with caution. All at once the hoof-stroke ceases to be heard, and stillness reigns around. No sound save that made by the claws of the dog that continues its task with unabated assiduity. 
not yet having taken any notice of the footsteps it can scarce fail to hear. Its master cannot help thinking this strange. Brasford is not wont to be this unwatchful, and of all men Richard Dark should be the last to approach him unawares. What may it mean? While thus interrogating himself, Clancy again hears the tramp-tramp. The horse is no longer in a walk, but with pace quickened to a trot, and still Brasford keeps on scraping. Only when a shadow darkens over does he desist, the horseman now being close behind Clancy's head, with his image reflected in front. But, instead of rushing at him with a savage growl, as he certainly would if it were Richard Dark, Brasford but raises his snout and wags his tail, giving utterance to a note of friendly salutation. Clancy's astonishment is extreme, changing to joy when the horseman, after making the circuit of his head, comes to a halt before his face. In the broad, bright moonlight he beholds, not his direst foe, but his faithful servitor. There, upon his own horse, with his own gun in hand, sits one who causes him mechanically to exclaim, Jupiter! adding, Heaven has heard my prayer. And mine, says Jupiter, soon as somewhat recovered from his astonishment at what he sees. Yes, Master Charlie, I've been praying for you ever since they part us. Though we'll never expect to see you live again. But, Lord of mercy, Master, what this mean? I see nothing but your head. Wherever is your body? What have them rascally ruffians been and done to you? As you see, buried me alive. Better that than bury you dead. You sure, massa? He asks, slipping down from the saddle and placing himself vis-a-vis -vis with the face so strangely situated. You sure you ain't wounded nor otherwise hurt? Not that I know of. I only feel a little bruised and faint-like, but I think I've received no serious injury. I'm now suffering from thirst more than aught else. That won't be for long. Lucky I just found your old canteen on the saddle, and fill it for I left the creek. I just got something besides that'll take the faintness away from you. A drop of corn juice I had from that Spanish Indian they called a half-blood. Not much blood in him now. It is, Master Charlie. While speaking, he had produced a gourd in which something gurgles. Its smell, when the stopper is taking out, tells it to be whiskey. Inserting the neck between his master's lips, he pours some of the spirit down his throat, and then, turning to the horse nearby, he lifts from the saddle horn a larger gourd, the canteen, containing water. In a few seconds, not only is Clancy's thirst satisfied, but he feels his strength restored and all faintness passed away. Up to the chin, I declare, says Jupiter, now more particularly, taking note of his situation. Sure enough, all but buried alive. And Bassett been a trying to dig you out. Gee, horror! Ain't that cunning of the old dog? He proved himself a faithful critter. Like yourself, Jupe. But say, how have you escaped from the robbers? Brought my horse and gun, too. Tell me all. Not so fast, Master Charlie. It's something of a longish story, and a bit strangers, too. You'd be better out of that fix afore hearing it. Though your ears ain't stopped, you's not in a position to listen patient or comfortable. Let me finish what Brassford begun, and get out the balance of your body. Saying this, the mulatto sets himself to the task proposed. Upon his knees, with knife in hand, he loosens the earth around Clancy's breast and shoulders, cutting it carefully, then clawing it out. The hound helps him, dashing in whenever it sees a chance, with its paws scattering the clods to rear. The animal seems jealous of Jupiter's interference, half angry at not having all the credit to itself. Between them, the work progresses, and the body of their common master will soon be disinterred. All the while, Clancy and the mulatto continue to talk, mutually communicating their experiences since parting. Those of the former, though fearful, are neither many nor varied, and require but few words. What Jupiter now sees gives him a clue to nearly all. His own narrative covers a greater variety of events, and needs more time for telling than can be conveniently spared. Instead of details, therefore, he but recounts the leading incidents in brief epitome, to be more particularly dwelt upon afterwards, as opportunity will allow. He relates how, after leaving the lone cottonwood, 
he has been taken on across the plain to a creek called Coyote, where the robbers have a camping place. This slightly touched upon, he tells of his own treatment, of his being carried into a tent at first, but little looked after, because thought secure from their having him tightly tied. Through a slit in the skin cover, he saw them kindle a fire and commence cooking. Soon after came the chief, riding Clancy's horse, with Chisholm and the other three. Seeing the horse, he supposed it was all over for his master. Then the feast, all fresco, succeeded by the transformation scene, the red robbers becoming white ones, to all of which he was witness. After that, the card playing by the campfire, during which the chief came to his tent and did what he could to draw him. In this part of his narration, the mulatto with modest naivete hints of his own adroitness, how he threw his inquisitor off the scent and became at length disembarrassed of him. He is even more reticent about an incident soon after succeeding, but referred to it at an early part of his explanation. On the blade of his knife, before beginning to dig, Clancy, observing some blotches of crimson, asks what it is. Only a little blood, Master Charlie, is the answer. Whose? You'll hear before I get to the end. Enough now to say it's the blood of a bad man. Clancy does not press him further, knowing he will be told all in due time. Still is he impatient, wondering whether it will be the blood of Jim Borlas or Richard Dark, for he supposes it either one or the other. He hopes it may be the former, and fears its being the latter. Even yet, in his hour of uncertainty, late helpless, and still with only half hope of being able to keep his oath, he would not for all the world Dick Dark's blood should be shed by other hand than his own. He is mentally relieved long before Jupiter reaches the end of his narration. The blood upon the blade, now clean scoured off, was not that of Richard Dark. For the mulatto tells him of that tragic scene within the tent, speaking of it without the slightest remorse. The incidents succeeding he leaves for a future occasion. How he stole out the horse, and with Brassard's help, was enabled to return upon the trail as far as the cottonwood. Thence on, the hound hurriedly leading, at length leaving him behind. But, before coming to this, he has completed his task, and laying hold of his master's shoulders, he draws him out of the ground, as a gardener would a gigantic carrot. Once more on the earth's surface stands Clancy, free of body, unfettered in limb, strong in his sworn resolve, determined, as ever, to keep it. End of 80 Chapter 81 of The Death Shot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Death Shot by Thomas Maine Reed. 81. The Voice of Vengeance. Never did man believe himself nigher death, or experience greater satisfaction at being saved from it, than Charles Clancy. For upon his life so near lost, and as if miraculously preserved, depend issues dear to him as that life itself. And these, too, may reach a successful termination. Something whispers him they will. But, though grateful to God for the timely succor just received, and on him still reliant, he does not ask God for guidance in what he intends now. Rather, shuns he the thought, as though fearing the all-merciful might not be with him, for he is still determined on vengeance, which alone belongs to the Lord. Of himself he's strong enough to take it, and feels so, after being refreshed by another drink of the whiskey. The spirit of the alcohol, acting on his own, reinvigorates and makes him ready for immediate action. But he stays to think what may be his safest course, as the surest and swiftest. His repeated repulses, while making more cautious, have done naught to daunt or drive him from his original purpose. Recalling his latest interview with Helen Armstrong, and what he then said, he dares not swerve from it. To go back, leaving it undone, were a humiliation no lover would like to confess to his sweetheart. But he has no thought of going back, and only hesitates, reflecting on the steps necessary to ensure success. He now knows why Dark retreated in such wild affright. Some speeches passing between the robbers overheard by Jupiter, and by him reported, enabled Clancy to grasp the situation. As he had conjectured, Dark was straying, and by chance came that way. No wonder at the way he went. It is not an hour since he fled from the spot, and in all likelihood he is still straying. If so, he cannot be a great way off, but, far or near, Brassfort can find him. 
it is but a question of whether he can be overtaken before reaching the rendezvous for the only danger of which clancy has dread or allows himself to dwell upon is from the other robbers even of these he feels not much fear but for the mulatto and his mule he would never have allowed them to lay hand on him and now with his splendid horse once more by his side the saddle awaiting him he knows he'll be safe from any pursuit by mounted men as a bird upon the wing for the safety of his faithful follower he has already conceived measures jupiter is to make his way back to the san saba and wait for him at their old camp near the crossing failing to come he is to proceed on to the settlement and there take his chances of a reception though the fugitive slave may be recognized under sime woodley's protection he will be safe and with helen armstrong's patronage sure of hospitable entertainment with all this mentally arranged though not yet communicated to jupe clancy gives a look to his gun to assure himself it is in good order another to the comparison of his horse and satisfied with both he at length leaps into the saddle the mulatto has been regarding his movements with uneasiness there is that in them which forewarns him of still another separation he is soon made aware of it by the instructions given him in accordance with the plan sketched out on clancy telling him he is to return to the san saba alone with the reasons why he should do so he listens in pained surprise sure you don't intend leaving me massa charlie i do i must but why are you going yourself where god guides it may be his avenging angel yes jupe i'm off again on that scoundrel's track this shall be my last trial if it turn out as hitherto you may never see me more you nor any one else failing i shan't care to face humankind much less her i love ah i'll more dread meeting my mother her death unavenged bah there's no fear one way or the other so don't you have any uneasiness about the result but do as i have directed make back to the river and wait there at the crossing brassford goes with me and when you see us again i'll have a spare horse to carry you on to our journey's end that whose shoes made those scratches just now i take it between the legs of dick dark dear massa rejoins jupiter in earnest protest why need you go worrying after that man now you have plenty of opportunity any day he ain't likely to leave texas long as that young lady stays in it besides them cutthroats at the creek she'll come after me they'll be this way as soon as they find me gone and set their eyes on that streak of red color i left behind me in the tent take my advice massa Tolly, and let's both slip out of our way by pushing straight for the settlement no settlement till i've settled with him he can't have got far away yet good brassford you'll do your best to help me find him the hound gives a low growl and rollicks around the legs of the horse seeming to say set me on the scent i'll show you something more than instinct appears to inspire the molossian though weeks have elapsed since in the cypress swamp it made savage demonstrations against dark when taking up his trail through the san saba bottom it behaved as if actuated by the old malice remembering the smell of the man and now conducted beyond the place trodden by borlas and the others soon as outside the confusion of scents and catching his fresher one it sends forth a cry strangely intoned altogether unlike the ordinary bay while trailing a stag it is the deep sonorous note of the sleuth hound on slot of human game such as oft in the times of spanish american colonization struck terror to the heart of the hunted aboriginal as already said brassford has a strain of the bloodhound in him enough to make danger for richard dark under the live oak the hound would have pulled him from his saddle torn him to pieces on the spot but for jupiter to whom it was consigned holding it hard back clancy neither intends nor desires it do so now all he wants with it is to bring him face to face with his hated foeman that done the rest he will do himself everything decided and settled he hastily takes leave of jupiter and starts off along the trail brassford leading both are soon far away on the wide waste the mulatto stands alone looking after half reproachfully for being left behind regretting his master's rashness painfully apprehensive he may never see him more end of eighty one chapter eighty two of the death shot this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Death Shot by Thomas Main Reed. 82. A Man Nearly Mad. Am I still drunk? Am I dreaming? So Richard Dark interrogates himself, retreating from the strangest apparition human eyes ever saw. A head without any body, not lying as after careless decapitation, but as though still upon shoulders, the eyes glancing and rolling, the lips moving, speaking, the whole thing alive. The head, too, of one he supposes himself to have assassinated, and for which he is a felon and fugitive. No wonder he doubts the evidence of his senses, and at first deems it fancy, an illusion from dream or drink, but a suspicion also sweeps through his soul, which, more painfully impressing, causes him to add still another interrogatory. Am I mad? He shakes his head and rubs his eyes to assure himself he is awake, sober, and sane. He is all three, though he might well wish himself drunk or dreaming, for, so scared is he, there is in reality a danger of his senses forsaking him. He tries to account for the queer thing, but cannot. Who could, circumstanced as he? From that day when he stooped over Clancy, holding Helen Armstrong's photograph before his face, and saw his eyes film over in sightless gaze, the sure forerunner of death, he has ever believed him dead. No rumor has reached him to the contrary. No newspaper paragraph from which he might draw his deductions, as more or less is done. True, he observed some resemblance to Clancy in the man who surprised him under the live oak. But, recalling that scene under the cypress, how could he have a thought of it being he? He could not, cannot, does not yet. But what about the head? How is he to account for that? and the cries sent after him, still ringing in his ears. His own name, with the added accusation he himself believes true, the brand. Murderer. Am I indeed mad? He again asks himself, riding on recklessly without giving guidance to his horse. His trembling hand can scarce retain hold of the rein, and the animal, uncontrolled, is left to take its course. Only, it must not stop or stay. Every time it shows sign of lagging, he kicks mechanically against its ribs, urging it on, on anywhere, away from that dread, damnable apparition. It is some time before he recovers sufficient coolness to reflect, then only with vague comprehensiveness, nothing clear save the fact that he has completely lost himself and his way. To go on were mere guesswork. True, the moon tells him the west, the direction of Coyote Creek, but westward he will not go dreading to again encounter that ghostly thing, for he thinks it was there he saw it. Better pull up and await the surer guidance of the sun, with its light less mystical. So deciding, he slips out of the saddle, and, letting his horse out on the trail rope, lays himself down. Regardless of the animal's needs, he leaves all its caparison on, even to the bit between his teeth. What cares he for its comforts, or for aught else, thinking of that horrible head? He makes no endeavor to snatch a wink of sleep, of which he has had enough, but lies cogitating on the series of strange incidents and sights which have late occurred to him, but chiefly the last, so painfully perplexing. He can think of nothing to account for a phenomenon so abnormal, so outside all laws of nature. While vainly endeavoring to solve the dread enigma, a sound strikes upon his ear, abruptly bringing his conjectures to a close. It is a dull thumping still faint and far off, but distinguishable as the tramp of a horse. Starting to his feet, he looks in the direction whence it proceeds. As expected, he sees a horse, and something more, a man upon his back, both coming towards him. Could it, perchance, be Bosley? Impossible. He was their prisoner under the live oak. They would never let him go. Far more likely it is Woodley, the terrible backwoodsman, as ever after him. Whoever it be, his guilty soul tells him the person approaching can be no friend of his, but an enemy, a pursuer, and it may be another phantom. Earthly fears with unearthly fancies alike urging him to flight. He stays not to make sure whether it be ghost or human, but, hastily taking up his trail rope, springs to the back of his horse and again goes off in a wild, terrified retreat. It scarce needs telling that the horseman who has disturbed Richard Dark's uncomfortable reflections is Charles Clancy. Less than an hour has elapsed since he started on the trail, which he has followed fast, the fresh scent enabling Brasfort to take it up in a run. 
From the way it zigzagged and circled about, Clancy could tell the track steed had been going without guidance, as also guessed the reason. The rider, fleeing in a fright, has given no heed to direction. All this the pursuer knows to be in his favor, showing that the pursued man has not gone to Coyote Creek, but will still be on the step, possibly astray, and perhaps not far off. Though himself making quick time, he is not carelessly pursuing. On the contrary, taking every precaution to ensure success. He knows that on the hard turf his horse's tread can be heard at a great distance, and to hinder this he has put the animal to a pace, a gait peculiar to Texas and the southwestern states. Thus, combining speed with silence has carried him on quickly as in a canter. The hound he is once more muzzled, though not holding it in leash, and the two have gone gliding along silent as specters. At each turn of the trail he directs looks of inquiry ahead. One is at length rewarded. He is facing the moon, whose disk almost touches the horizon, when alongside it he perceives something dark upon the plain, distinguishable as the figure of a horse. It is stationary, with head to the ground, as if grazing, though by the uneven outline of its back it bears something like a saddle. Continuing to scrutinize, he sees it as this, and, moreover, makes out the form of a man, or what resembles one, lying along the earth nearby. These observations take only an instant of time, and while making them he is halted, and by a word spoken low, called his hound off the trail. The well-trained animal, obeying, turns back and stands by his side, waiting. The riderless horse, with the dismounted rider, are still a good way off, more than half a mile. At that distance he could not distinguish them but for the position of the moon, favoring his view. Around her rim the luminous sky makes more conspicuous the dark forms interposed between. He can have no doubt as to what they are. If he had, it is soon solved. For, while gazing upon them, not in conjecture, but as to how he may best make approach, he perceives the tableau suddenly change. The horse tosses up its head, while the man starts upon his feet. In an instant they are together, and the rider in his saddle. And now Clancy is quite sure, for the figure of the horseman, outlined against the background of moonlit sky, clear-edged as a medallion, shows the feathered circlet surmounting his head. To all appearance, a red savage, in reality a white one. Richard Dark. Clancy stays not to think further. If he did, he would lose distance. For soon as in the saddle, Dark goes off in full headlong gallop. In like gait follows the avenger, forsaking the cautious pace and no longer caring for silence. Still, there is no noise, save that of the hammering hooves, now and then a clink as their iron shoeing strikes a stone. Otherwise silent, pursuer and pursued, but with very different reflections. The former terrified, half frenzied, seeking to escape from whom he knows not. The latter, cool, courageous, trying to overtake one he knows too well. Clancy pursues with but one thought, to punish the murder of his mother. And sure, he will succeed now. Already is the space shortened between them, growing less with every leap of the horse. A few strides more, and Richard Dark will be within range of his rifle. Letting drop the reins, he takes firmer grasp of his gun. His horse needs no guidance, but goes on as before, still gaining. He is now within a hundred lengths of the retreating foe, but still too far off for a sure shot. Besides, the moon is in front, her light dazzling his eyes, the man he intends to take aim at, going direct for her disc, as if with a design to ride into it. While he delays, calculating the distance, suddenly the moon becomes obscured, the chased horseman simultaneously disappearing from his sight. End of 82 Chapter 83 of The Death Shot This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn The Death Shot by Thomas Main Reed 83. At Length, The Death Shot Scarce for an instant is Clancy puzzled by the sudden disappearance of him pursued. That is accounted for by the simplest of causes, a large rock rising above the level of the plain, a loose boulder whose breadth interposing covers the disk of the moon. A slight change of direction has brought it between, Dark having deflected from his course and struck towards it. Never did the hunted fox, close pressed by hounds, make more eagerly for cover or seek it so despairingly as he. 
He has long ago been aware that the pursuer is gaining upon him. At each anxious glance cast over his shoulder, he sees the distance decreased, while the tramp of the horse behind sounds clearer and closer. He is in doubt what to do. Every moment he may hear the report of a gun and have a bullet into his back. He knows not the instant he may be shot out of his saddle. Shall he turn upon the pursuer, make stand, and meet him face to face? He dares not. The dread of the unearthly is still upon him. It may be the devil. The silence, too, awes him. The pursuing horseman has not yet hailed, has not spoken word, or uttered exclamation. Were it not for the heavy trot of the hoof, he might well believe him a spectre. If Dark only knew who it is, he would fear him as much or more. Knowing not, he continues his flight, doubting, distracted. He has but one clear thought, the instinct common to all chaste creatures, to make for some shelter. A copse, a tree, even were it but a bush, anything to conceal him from the pursuer's sight, from the shot he expects soon to be sent after him. Ah, what is that upon the plain, a rock, and large enough to screen both him and his horse, the very thing? Instinctively he perceives his advantage. Behind the rock he can make stand, and, without hesitation, he heads his horse for it. It is a slight change from his former direction, and he loses a little ground, but recovers it by increasing speed. For, encouraged by the hope of getting under shelter, he makes a last spurt, urging his animal to the utmost. He is soon within the shadow of the rock, still riding towards it. It is just then that Clancy loses sight of him, as of the moon, but he is now also near enough to distinguish the huge stone and, while scanning its outlines, he sees the chased horseman turn round it, so rapidly, and at such distance, he withholds his shot, fearing it may fail. Between pursued and pursuer, the chances have changed, and as the latter reins up to consider what he should do, he sees something glisten above the boulder, clearly distinguishable as the barrel of a gun. At the same instant, a voice salutes him, saying, I don't know who or what you are but I warn you to come no nearer. You do. I send a bullet. Great God! With a profane exclamation, the speaker suddenly interrupts himself, his voice having changed from its tone of menace to trembling, for the moonlight is full upon the face of him threatened. He can trace every feature distinctly. It is the same he late saw on the sun ice of the plain. It can be no dream, nor freak of fancy. Clancy is still alive, or, if dead, he, dark, is looking upon his wraith. To his unfinished speech he receives instant rejoinder. You don't know who I am? Learn, then. I'm the man you tried to assassinate in a Mississippian forest, Charles Clancy, who means to kill you, fairer fashion, here on this Texas plain. Dick Dark, if you have a prayer to say... Say it soon, for as sure as you stand behind that rock, I intend taking your life. The threat is spoken in a calm, determined tone, as if surely to be kept, all the more terrible to Richard Dark, who cannot yet realize the fact of Clancy's being alive. But that stern summons must have come from mortal lips, and the form before him is no spirit, but living flesh and blood. Terror-stricken, appalled, shaking as with an ague, the gun almost drops from his grasp, but with a last desperate resolve and effort mechanical, scarce knowing what he does, he raises the piece to his shoulder and fires. Clancy sees the flash, the jet, the white smoke puffing skyward, then hears the crack. He has no fear, knowing himself at a safe distance, for at this he is halted. He does not attempt to return the fire, nor rashly rush on. Dark carries a double-barreled gun, and has still a bullet left. Besides, he has the advantage of position, the protecting rampart, the moon behind his back, and in the eyes of his assailant, everything in favor of the assailed. Though chafing in angry impatience, with the thirst of vengeance unappeased, Clancy restrains himself, measuring the ground with his eyes, and planning how he may dislodge his skulking antagonist. Must he lay siege to him, and stay there till... A low yelp interrupts his cogitations. Looking down, he sees Brassford by his side. In the long trial of speed between the two horses, the hound had dropped behind. The halt has enabled it to get up, just in time to be of service to its master, who has suddenly conceived a plan for employing it. 
Leaping from his saddle, he lays hold of the muzzle strap, quickly unbuckling it. As though divining the reason, the dog dashes on for the rock, soon as its jaws are released, giving out a fierce, angry growl. Dark sees it approaching in the clear moonlight, can distinguish its marks, remembers them. Clancy's staghound. Surely Nemesis, with all hell's hosts, are let loose on him. He recalls how the animal once set upon him. Its hostility then is not to that now, for it has reached the rock, turned it, and open-mouthed springs at him like a panther. In vain he endeavors to avoid it, and still keeping under cover. While shunning its teeth, he has also to think of Clancy's gun. He cannot guard against both, if either, for the dog has caught hold of his right leg and fixed its fangs in the flesh. He tries to beat it off, striking with the butt of his gun, to no purpose now, for his horse, excited by the attack, and madly prancing, has parted from the rock, exposing him to the aim of the pursuer, who has, meanwhile, rushed up within rifle range. Clancy sees his advantage, and raises his gun, quick as for the shooting of a snipe. The crack comes, and, simultaneous with it, Richard Dark is seen to drop out of his saddle, and fall face foremost on the plain, his horse, with a wild neigh, bolting away from him. The fallen man makes no attempt to rise, nor movement of any kind, save a convulsive tremor through his frame, the last throw of parting life, which precedes the settled stillness of death, for, surely, is he dead. Clancy, dismounting, advances toward the spot, hastily, to hinder the dog from tearing him, which the enraged animal seems determined to do. Chiding it off, he bends over the prostrate body, which he perceives has ceased to breathe. A sort of curiosity, some impulse irresistible, prompts him to look for the place where his bullet struck, in the heart, as he can see by the red stream still flowing forth. Just where he hit me. After all, not strange. No coincidence. I aimed at him there. For a time he stands gazing down upon the dead man's face. Silently, without taunt or recrimination, on his own there is no sign of savage triumph, no fiendish exultation, far from his thoughts to insult or outrage the dead. Justice has been requited, and vengeance been appeased. It is neither his rival in love nor his mortal enemy who now lies at his feet, but a breathless body, a lump of senseless clay, all the passions late inspiring it, good and bad, gone to be balanced elsewhere. As he stands regarding Dark's features in their death pallor, showing livid by the moon's mystic light, a cast of sadness comes upon his own, and he says in subdued soliloquy, Painful to think I have taken a man's life, even his. I wish it could have been otherwise. It could not. I was compelled to it. And... Surely God will forgive me for ridding the world of such a wretch. Then, raising himself to an erect attitude, with eyes upturned to heaven, as when in the cemetery over his mother's grave he made that solemn vow, remembering it, he now adds in like solemn tone, I've kept my oath, mother. Thou art avenged. End of 83 Chapter 84 of The Death Shot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Death Shot by Thomas Maine Reed. 84. The Scout's Report. While these tragic incidents are occurring on Coyote Creek in the plain between, others, almost as exciting but of less sanguinary character, take place in the valley of the San Saba. As the morning sun lights up the ancient mission house, its walls still reverberate wailing cries mingled with notes of preparation for the pursuit. Then follows a forenoon of painful suspense, no word yet from the scouters sent out. Colonel Armstrong and the principal men of the settlement have ascended to the Azotea to obtain a better view, and there remain gazing down the valley in feverish impatience. Just as the sun reaches meridian, their wistful glances are rewarded, but by a sight which little relieves their anxiety, on the contrary, increasing it. A horseman, emerging from the timber which skirts the river's bank, comes on towards the mission building. He is alone, a riding at top speed, both circumstances having sinister significance. Has the scouting party been cut off, 
and he only escaped to tell the tale? Is it Dupre, Hawkins, or who? He is yet too far off to be identified. As he draws nearer, Colonel Armstrong, through a telescope, makes him out to be Chris Tucker. Why should the young hunter be coming back alone? After a mutual interchange of questions and conjectures, they leave off talking and silently stand, breathlessly awaiting his arrival. Soon as he is within hailing distance, several unable to restrain themselves call out, inquiring the news. Not bad, gentlemen. Rather good than other ways, shouts back Chris. His response lifts a load from their hearts, and in calmer mood they await further information. In a short time the scout presents himself before Colonel Armstrong, around whom the others cluster, all alike eager to hear the report, for they are still under anxiety about the character of the despoilers, having as yet no reason to think them other than Indians. Nor does Tucker's account contradict this idea, though one thing he has to tell begets a suspicion to the contrary. Rapidly, and briefly as possible, the young hunter gives details of what has happened to Dupre's party, up to the time of his separating from it, first making their minds easy by assuring them that it was then safe. They were delayed a long time in getting upon the trail of the robbers, from these having taken a bypath leading along the base of the bluff. At length, having found the route of their retreat, they followed it over the lower ford, and there saw a sign to convince them that the Indians, still supposing them such, had gone on across the bottom and in all probability up the bluff beyond, thus identifying them with the band which the hunters had seen and tracked down. Indeed, no one doubted this, nor could. But while the scouters were examining the return tracks, they came upon others less intelligible, in short, perplexing. There were the hoof marks of four horses and a mule, all shod, first seen upon a side trace leading from the main ford road. Striking into and following it for a few hundred yards, they came upon a place where men had encamped and stayed for some time, perhaps slept. The grass bent down showed where their bodies had been a stretch, and these men must have been white. Fragments of biscuit, with other debris of eatables not known to the Indians, were evidence of this. Returning from the abandoned bivouac with the intention to ride straight back to the mission, the scouters came upon another side trace leading out on the opposite side of the ford road and up the river. On this they again saw the tracks of the shod horses and the mule, among them the footprints of a large dog. Taking this second trace, it conducted them to a glade with a grand tree, a live oak, standing in its center. The sign told of the party having stopped there also. While occupied in examining their traces, and much mystified by them, they picked up an article which, instead of making matters clearer, tended to mystify them more. A wig. Of all things in the world, this, in such a place. Still, not so strange either, seeing that it was the counterfeit of an Indian chevalier the hair long and black, taken from the tail of a horse. For all, it had never belonged to, or covered, a red man's skull, since it was that worn by Bosley, and torn from his head when Woodley and Haywood were stripping him for examination. The scouters, of course, could not know this, and, while inspecting the queer waif, wondered what it could mean. Two others were taken up, one a sprig of cypress, the other an orange blossom, both showing as if but lately plucked, and alike out of place there. Dupre, with some slight botanic knowledge, knew that no orange tree grew near, nor yet any cypress. But he remembered having observed both in the mission garden, into which the girls had been last seen going. Without being able to guess why they should have brought sprig or flower along, he was sure they had themselves been under the live oak tree. Where were they now? In answer, Hawkins had cried, Gone this way! Here's the tracks of the shod horses leading upstream. This side. Let's follow them. So they had done after dispatching Tucker with the report. It is so far satisfactory, better than anyone expected, and inspires Colonel Armstrong with a feeling akin to hope. Something seems to whisper him that his lost children will be recovered. Long ere the sun has set over the valley of the San Saba, his heart is filled and thrilled with joy indescribable for his daughters are by his side, their arms around his neck, tenderly, lovingly entwining it, as on that day when they were told they must forsake their stately Mississippian home for a hovel in Texas. All have reached the mission, for the scouting party, having overtaken that of Woodley, came in along with it. No, not all. Two are still missing, Clancy and Jupiter. 
About the latter, Woodley has made no one the wiser, though he tells Clancy's strange experience, which, while astounding his auditory, fills them with keen apprehension for the young man's fate. Keenest is that in the breast of Helen Armstrong. Herself saved, she is now all the more solicitous about the safety of her lover. Her looks bespeak more than anxiety, anguish. But there is that being done to hinder her from despairing. The pursuers are rapidly getting ready to start out, and with zeal unabated. For, although circumstances have changed by the recovery of the captives, there is sufficient motive for pursuit, the lost treasure to be retaken, the outlaws chastened, Clancy's life to be saved, or his death avenged. Woodley's words have fired them afresh, and they are impatient to set forth. Their impatience reaches its climax when Colonel Armstrong, with head uncovered, his white hair blown up by the evening breeze, addresses them, saying, Fellow citizens, we have to thank the Almighty that our dear ones have escaped a great danger. But while grateful to God, let us remember there is a man also deserving gratitude, a brave young man we all believe dead, murdered, he is still alive, let us hope so. Simeon Woodley has told us of the danger he is now in, death, if he fall into the hands of these desperate outlaws. Friends and fellow citizens, I need not appeal to you on behalf of this noble youth. I know you are all of one mind with myself, that come what will, cost what it may, Charles Clancy must be saved. The enthusiastic shout, sent up in response to the old soldier's speech, tells that the pursuit will be at least energetic and earnest. Helen Armstrong, standing retired, looks more hopeful now, and with her hope is mingled pride at the popularity of him to whom she has given heart and promised hand. Something more to make her happy. She now knows that, in bestowing both, she will have the approval of her father. End of 84 Chapter 85 of The Death Shot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Death Shot by Thomas Maine Reed. 85. A Change of Program. On the far frontier of Texas, still unsettled by civilized man, no Chanticleer gives note of the dawn. Instead, the Meliagris salutes the sunrise with a cry equally high-toned and quite as home-like, for the gobbling of the wild turkey cock is scarcely distinguishable from that of his domesticated brother of the farmyard. A gang of these great birds has roosted in the pecan grove close to where the prairie pirates are encamped. At daylight's approach, they fly up to the tops of the trees, the males, as is their wont in the spring months of the year, mutually sounding their sonorous challenge. It awakes the robbers from their slumber succeeding their drunken debauch, their chief first of any. Coming forth from his tent, he calls upon the others to get up, ordering several horses to be saddled. He designs dispatching a party to the upper plain, in search of Quantrell and Bosley, not yet come to camp. He wants another word with the mulatto, and steps toward the tent where he supposes the man to be. At its entrance he sees blood, inside a dead body. His cry, less of sorrow than anger, brings his followers around. One after another, peering into the tent, they see what is there. There is no question about how the thing occurred. It is clear to all. Their prisoner has killed his guard, as they say, assassinated him. Has the assassin escaped? They scatter in search of him by twos and threes, rushing from tent to tent. Some proceed to the corral, there to see that the bars are down and the horses out. These are discovered in a strip of meadow nearby, one only missing. It is that the chief had seized from their white prisoner and appropriated. The yellow one has replevened it. The ghastly spectacle in the tent gives them no horror. They are too hardened for that. But it makes them feel, notwithstanding, first anger, soon succeeded by apprehension. The dullest brood in the band has some perception of danger as its consequence. Hitherto their security had depended on keeping up their incognito by disguises and the secrecy of their camping place. Here is a prisoner escaped, who knows all, can tell about their travesties, 
guide a pursuing party to the spot. They must remain no longer there. Orlas, recognizing the necessity for a change of program, summons his following around him. Boys, he says, I needn't point out to you that this ugly business puts us in a bit of a fix. We got to clear out of here right quick. I reckon our best way'll be to make tracks for San Antone and there scatter. Even then, we won't be too safe if Yellow Skin turns up to tell his story about us. Lucky a nigger's testimony don't count for much in a Texan court, and there's still a chance to make it count for nothing by our knocking him on the head. All look surprised, their glances interrogating. How? I see y'all don't understand me, pursues Borlas in explanation. It's easy enough, but we must mount at once and make after him. He won't so readily find his way across the cut rock plain, and I tell yous, boys, it's our only chance. There are dissenting voices. Some urge the danger of going back that way. They may meet the outraged settlers. No fear of them yet, argues the chief, but there will be if the nigger meets em. We needn't go to the San Saba. If we don't overtake him for reaching the cottonwood, we'll have to let him slide. Then we can hurry back here and go down the creek to Colorado. The course counseled, seeming best, is decided on. Hastily saddling their horses and stowing their plunder in a place where it will be safe till they return, they mount and start off for the upper plain. Silence again reigns around the deserted camp. No human voice there. No sound save the calling of the wild turkeys that cannot awake that ghastly sleeper. At the same hour, almost the very moment, when Borlas and his freebooters, ascending from Coyote Creek, set foot on the table plain, a party of mounted men coming up from the San Saba bottom strikes it on the opposite edge. It is scarce necessary to say that these are the pursuing settlers, Dupre at their head. Hardly have they struck out into the sterile waste before getting bewildered with neither trace nor track to give them a clue to the direction but they have with them a surer guide than the footprints of men or the hoof marks of horses, their prisoner, Bill Bosley. To save his life, the wretch told all about his late associates and is now conducting the pursuers to Coyote Creek. Withal, he is not sure of the way and halts hesitatingly. Woodley, mistaking his uncertainty for reluctance, puts a pistol to his head, saying, Bill Bosley, although I don't make estimate of your life as more account than that of a cat, it may be, I suppose, precious to yourself. And you can only save it by taking us straight to what you say Jim Borlas and his beauties air. Show sign of prevarication, or go a yard's length out of the right track, and, well, I won't shoot you as I'm threatening. That'd be a death too good to such as you. But I promise you'll get your neck stretched on the nearest tree. And if no tree turn up, I'll tie you to the tail of my horse and hang you that way. So, take your choice. If you want to chaw on any more coin, don't tempt playing possum. I ain't no thought of it, protests Bosley. Indeed I ain't, Sime. I'm only puzzled about the trail from here. Though I've been across this plain several times, I never took much notice being with the others. I only know there's a tree stands by itself. If we can reach that, the road's easier beyond it. I think it's out yonder ways, he points in particular direction. Well, we'll try that way, says Syme, adding, If your story don't prove straight, they'll come a crick in your neck soon as it's discovered to be crooked. So waste no more words, but strike for the timor you speak of. The alacrity with which Bosley obeys tells he is sincere. Proof of his sincerity is soon after obtained in the tree itself being observed. Far off, they decry it outlined against the clear sky, solitary as a ship at sea. Yon it is, sure enough, says Woodley, first sighting it. I reckon the skunk's telling us the truth about that stick of timber being a finger post. Therefore, no more dilly down in, but on to it quick as our critters can take us. There's a man's life in danger, one that's dear to me, as I reckon he'd be to all ye, if you knowed him same as I do. You heard what the old colonel said as we was starting out. Cost what it might, Charlie Clancy air to be saved. So put the prod to your critters and let's on. Saying this, the hunter spurs his horse to its best speed, 
and soon all are going at full gallop in straight course for the cottonwood. End of 85 Chapter 86 of The Death Shot This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn The Death Shot by Thomas Main Reed 86. Alone with the Dead Beside the body of his fallen foe stands Charles Clancy, but with no intention there to tarry long. The companionship of the dead is ever painful, whether it be friend or enemy. With the latter alone it may appeal. Something of this creeps over his spirit while standing there, for he has now no strong passion to sustain him, not even anger. After a few moments he turns his back on the corpse, calling Brassford away from it. The dog yet shows hostility, and, if permitted, would mutilate the lifeless remains. Its fierce canine instinct has no generous impulse. It is only restrained by scolding and threats. The sun is beginning to show above the horizon, and Clancy perceives Dark's horse tearing about over the plain. He is reminded of his promise made to Jupiter. The animal does not go clear off, but keeps circling around, as if it desired to come back again, the presence of the other horse attracting and giving it confidence. Clancy calls to it, gesticulating in a friendly manner, and uttering exclamations of encouragement. By little and little it draws nearer, till at length its muzzle is in contact with that of his own steed, and, seizing the bridle, he secures it. Casting a last look at the corpse, he turns to the horses, intending to take departure from that spot. So little time has been spent in the pursuit, and the short conflict succeeding, it occurs to him he may overtake Jupiter before the latter has reached the San Saba. Scanning around to get bearings, his eye is attracted to an object, now familiar, the lone cottonwood. It is not much over two miles off. On Dark's trail he must have ridden at least leagues. Its crooked course, however, explains the tree's proximity. The circles and zigzags have brought both pursued and pursuer nigh back to the starting point. Since the cottonwood is there, he cannot be so far from the other place he has such reason to remember, and, again running his eye around, he looks for it. He sees it not, as there is nothing now to be seen, except some scattered mold undistinguishable at the distance. Instead, the rising sun lights up the figure of a man, afoot, and more than a mile off, not standing still, but in motion, as he can see, moving towards himself. It is Jupiter. Thus concluding, he is about to mount and meet him when stayed by a strange reflection. I'll let Jupe have a look at his old master, he mutters to himself. He too had old scores to settle with him, many a one recorded on his skin. It may give him satisfaction to know the thing has ended. Meanwhile, the mulatto, for it is he, comes on, at first slowly and with evident caution in his approach. Soon he is seen to quicken his step, changing it to a run. At length arriving at the rock, breathless as one who reaches the end of the race. The sight which meets him there gives him but slight surprise. He has been prepared for it. In answer to Clancy's inquiry, he briefly explains his presence upon the spot. Disobedient to the instructions given him, instead of proceeding towards the San Saba bottom, he had remained upon the step, not stationary, but following his master as fast as he could, and keeping him in view as long as the distance allowed. Two things were in his favor. The clear moonlight and Dark's trail doubling back upon itself. For all, he had at length lost sight of the tracking horseman, but not till he had caught a glimpse of him tracked, fleeing before. It was the straight, tail-on-end chase that took both beyond reach of his vision. Noting the direction, he still went hastening after, soon to hear a sound which told him the chase had come to a termination. The strife commenced. This was the report of a gun its full round boom proclaiming it a smooth bore fowling piece. Remembering that his old master always carried this, his new one never, it must be the former who has fired the shot, and, as for a long while no other answered it, he was in despair, believing the latter killed. Then reaches here the angry bay of the bloodhound, with men's voices intermingled. Ending all, the dear sharp crack of a rifle, which, from the stillness that succeeded continuing, he knew to be the last shot. "'And it were the last, as I can see,' he says, winding up his account, and turning towards the corpse. "'Ah, you gin him what he thought he gave you, his death shot.' "'Yes, Jupe, he's got it at last. 
and strange enough in the very place where he hit me. You see where my bullet has struck him? The mulatto, stooping down over Dark's body, examines the wound, still dripping blood. You right, Massa Charlie. It's in the exact spot. Well, that is curious. Seems like your gun were guided by the hand of that avenging angel you spoke of. Having thus delivered himself, the fugitive slave becomes silent and thoughtful for a time, bending over the body of his once cruel master, now no more caring for his cruelty or in fear of being chastised by him. With what strange reflections must that spectacle inspire him? The outstretched arms lying helpless along the earth, the claw-like fingers now stiff and nerveless. He may be thinking how they once clutched a cowhide, vigorously laying it on his own back, leaving those terrible scars. Come, Jupe, says Clancy, rousing him from his reverie. We must mount and be off. Soon they are in their saddles, ready to start, but stay yet a little longer, for something has to be considered. It is necessary for them to make sure about their route. They must take precautions against getting strayed, as also another and still greater danger. Jupiter's escape from the robber's den, with the deed that facilitated it, will by this time have been discovered. It is more than probable he will be pursued, indeed almost certain, and the pursuers will come that way at any moment they may appear. This is the dark side of the picture presented to Clancy's imagination, as he turns his eyes toward the west. Facing in the opposite direction, his fancy summons up one brighter, for there lies the San Saba Mission House, within whose walls he will find Helen Armstrong. He has now no doubt that she has reached home in safety, knows, too, that her father still lives, for the mulatto has learned as much from the outlaws. While en route to Coyote Creek, and during his sojourn there, he overheard them speak about the massacre of the slaves, as also the immunity extended to their masters, with the reason for it. It is glad tidings to Clancy. His betrothed, restored to her father's arms, will not the less affectionately open her own to receive him. The long night of the sorrowing has passed. The morn of their joy comes. Its daylight is already dawning. He will have a welcome, sweet as ever met man. What's that out, Yana? exclaims Jupiter, pointing west. Clancy's rapture is interrupted, his bright dream dissipated, suddenly, as when a cloud drifts over the disk of the sun. And it is the sun which causes the change or rather the reflection of its rays from something seen afar off, over the plain. Several points sparkle, appearing and disappearing through a semi-opaque mass, whose dun color shows it to be dust. Experienced in prairie sign, he can interpret this, and does easily, but with a heaviness at his heart. The things that sparkle are guns, pistols, knives, belt buckles, bits, and stirrups while that through which they intermittingly shine is the stoor tossed up by the hooves of horses. It is a body of mounted men in march across the steppe. Continuing to scan the dust cloud, he perceives inside it a darker nucleus, evidently horses and men, though he is unable to trace the individual forms or make out their number. No matter for that, there is enough to identify them without. They are coming from the side of the Colorado, from Coyote Creek. Beyond doubt, the Desperados. End of 86 Chapter 87 of The Death Shot This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn The Death Shot by Thomas Main Reed 87 hostile cohorts. Perfectly sure that the band is that of Borlas, which he almost instantly is, Clancy draws his horse behind the rock, directing Jupiter to do likewise. Thus screened, they can command a view of the horsemen without danger of being themselves seen. For greater security, both dismount, the mulatto holding the horses, while his master sets himself to observe the movements of the approaching troop. Is it approaching? Yes, but not direct for the rock. Its head is towards the tree, and the robbers are evidently making to reach this. As already said, the topography of the place is peculiar, the lone cottonwood standing on the crest of a coteau de prairie, whose sides slope east and west. It resembles the roof of a house, but with gentler declination. Similarly situated on the summit of the ridge is the boulder, 
but with nearly a league's length between it and the tree. Soon as assured that the horsemen are heading for the latter, Clancy breathes freer breath, but without being satisfied he is safe. He knows they will not stay there. And where next? He reflects what might have been his fate were he still in the prairie stocks. Borlas will be sure to pay that place a visit. Not finding the victim of his cruelty, he will seek elsewhere. Will it occur to him to come on to the rock? Clancy so interrogates, with more coolness and less fear than may be imagined. His horse is beside him, and Jupiter has another. The mulatto is no longer encumbered by a mule. Dark's steed is known to be a swift one, and not likely to be outrun by any of the robber troop. If chased, some of them might overtake it, but not all, or not at the same time. There will be less danger from their following in detail, and thus Clancy less fears them, for he knows that his yellow-skinned comrade is strong as courageous, a match for any three ordinary men, and both are now well armed, Dark's double barrel as his horse having reverted to Jupiter. Besides, as good luck has it, there are pistols found in the holsters, to say nothing of that long-bladed and late blood-stained knife. In a chase they will have a fair chance to escape, and, if it comes to a fight, can make a good one. While he is thus speculating upon the probabilities of the outlaws coming on to the rock, and what may be the upshot afterwards, Clancy's ear is again saluted by a cry from his companion, but this time in tone very different, for it is jubilant, joyous. Turning, he sees Jupiter standing with face to the east, and pointing in that direction. To what? Another cloud of dust that prickles with sparkling points. Another mounted troop moving across the plain and also making for the tree, which, equidistant between the two, seems to be the beacon of both. Quick as he reached the conclusion about the first band being that of Borlas, does he decide as to that of the second. It is surely the pursuing colonists, and as sure was Sime Woodley at their head. Both cohorts are advancing at a like rate of speed, neither riding rapidly. They have been so, but now, climbing the acclivity, they have quieted their horses to a walk, the pace, though slow, continued, will in time bring them together. A collision seems inevitable. His glance gladdens as he measures the strength of the two parties, the former not only in greater number, but with God on their side, while the latter will be doing battle under the banner of the devil. About the issue of such encounter, he has no anxiety. He is only apprehensive it may not come off. Something may arise to warn the outlaws and give them a chance to shun it. As yet, neither party has a thought of the other's proximity or approach. They cannot, with the ridge between. Still is there that which should make them suspicious of something. Above each band are buzzards, a large flock. They flout the air in sportive flight, their instinct admonishing them that the two parties are hostile and likely to spill each other's blood. About the two sets of birds, what will both sides be saying? For, high in heaven, both must long since have observed them. From their presence, what conjectures will they draw? So Clancy questions, answering himself. More or less will suppose the flock of far to be hovering over my head, while Woodley may believe the other one above my dead body. Strange as it may appear, just thus, and at the same instant, are the two leaders interpreting the sign. And well for the result Clancy desires, since it causes neither to command halt or make delay. On the contrary, impels them forward more impetuously. Perceiving this, he mechanically mutters, Thank the Lord they must meet now. Curbing his impatience as he best can, he continues to watch the mutually approaching parties. At the head of the colonists, he now sees Syme Woodley, recognizing him by his horse, a brindled clay bank with stripes like a zebra. Would that he could communicate with his old comrade and give him word or a sign of warning. He dares not do either. To stir an inch from behind the rock would expose him to the view of the robbers, who might still turn and retreat. With heart beating audibly, blood coursing quick through his veins, he watches and waits, time in the crisis. It must come soon. The two flocks of vultures have met in midair and mingle their sweeping gyrations. They croak in mutual congratulations, anticipating a splendid repast. Clancy counts the moments. They cannot be many. The heads of the horsemen already align with the tufts of the grass growing topmost on the ridge. Their brows are above it, their eyes. They have sighted each other. A halt on both sides, horses hurriedly reined in. No shouts, only a word of caution from the respective leaders of the troops, each calling back to his own. 
Then an interval of silence, disturbed by the shrill screams of the horses, challenging from troop to troop, seemingly hostile as their riders. In another instant both have broken halt, and are going a gallop over the plain, not towards each other, but one pursuing, the other pursued. The robbers are in retreat. Clancy had not waited for this. His cue came before, soon as they caught sight of one another. Then, vaulting onto his saddle and calling Jupiter to follow, he was off, riding at top speed, cleaving the air till it whistles past his ears, with eyes strained forward, he sees the changed attitude of the troops. He reflects not on it. All his thoughts become engrossed, all his energies bent upon taking part in the pursuit, and still more in the fight he hopes will follow. He presses on in a diagonal line between pursued and pursuers. His splendid steed now shows its good qualities, and gladly he sees he is gaining upon both. With like gladness that they are nearing one another, the short-striding Mustangs being no match for the long-legged American horses. As yet not a shot has been fired. The distance is still too great for the range of rifles, and backwoodsmen do not idly waste ammunition. The only sounds heard are the trampling of the hooves and the occasional neigh of a horse. The riders are all silent, in both groups alike, one in the mute eagerness of flight, the other in the stern earnestness of pursuit. Now puffs of smoke arise over each, with jets of flame projected outward, shots at first dropping in single, then in thick rattling fusillade, along with them cries of encouragement mingled with shouts of defiance, then a wild hurrah, the charging cheers the colonists close upon the outlaws. Clancy rides straight for the fray. In front, he sees the plain shrouded in dense sulfurous mist at intervals illuminated by yellow flashes. Another spurt, in passing through the thin outer strata of smoke, he is in the thick of the conflict, among men on horseback grappling other mounted men, endeavoring to drag them out of the saddle, some afoot, fighting in pairs, firing pistols, or with naked knives hewing away at one another. He sees the fight is nigh finished, and the robbers routed. Some are dismounted, on their knees, crying quarter, and piteously appealing for mercy. Where is Sy Moodley? Has his old comrade been killed? Half frantic with this fear, he rushes distractedly over the ground, calling out the backwoodsman's name. He is answered by another, by Ned Haywood, who staggers to his side, bleeding, his face blackened with powder. You are wounded, Haywood? Yes, or I wouldn't be here. Why? Because Sime... Where is he? Went that way to chase a big brute of a fellow. I've just spied him passing through the smoke. For God's sake, after. Sime may stand in need of you. Clancy stays not to hear more, but again urges his horse to speed, with head in the direction indicated. Darting on, he is soon out into the clear atmosphere, there to see two horsemen going off over the plain, pursued and pursuer. In the former he recognizes Borlas, while in the latter is Woodley. Both are upon strong, swift horses, but, better mounted than either, he soon gains upon them. The backwoodsman is nearing the brigand. Clancy sees this with satisfaction, though not without anxiety. He knows Jim Borlas is an antagonist not to be despised. Driven to desperation, he will fight like a grizzly bear. Woodley will need all his strength, courage, and strategy. Eager to assist his old comrade, he presses onward, but before he can come up, they have closed and are at it. Not in combat, paces apart with rifles or pistols. Not a shot is being exchanged between them. Instead, they are close together, having clutched one another, and are fighting hand to hand with buoys. It commenced on horseback, but at the first grip both came to the ground, dragging each other down. Now the fight continues on foot, each with his bared blade hacking and hewing at the other. A dread spectacle, these two gigantic gladiators engaged in mortal strife. All the more in its silence. Neither utters shout or speaks word. They are too intent upon killing. The only sound heard is their hoarse breathing as they pant to recover it, each holding the other's arm to hinder the fatal stroke. Clancy's heart beats apprehensively for the issue, and with the rifle cocked, he rides on to send a bullet through Borlas. It is not needed. No gun is to give the coup de grace to the chief of the prairie pirates, for the blade of a bowie knife has passed between his ribs, laying him lifeless along the earth. You, Charlie Clancy, says Syme, in joyful surprise at seeing his friend still safe. Thank the Lord for it. 
but who'd a thought of meeting you in the middle of this scrimmage, and in time to stand by me head that been needful. But where have you come from? Dropped out of the clouds? And what a dick dark. I'd most forgot that little matter. Have you seen him? I have. Well, what's happened? Have you did anything to him? The same as you have done for him, answers Clancy, pointing to the body of more or less. Good for you. I noted it in that way. I said so to that sweet critter when I was leaving her at the mission. You left her there? Safe? Well, I left her in her father's arms, where I reckon she'd be safe enough. But where's Juke? He's here, somewhere behind. All right, that accounts for the whole party. Now let's back and see what's chance to the rest of this ruffian crew. So, Jim Borlas, good-bye. With this odd leave-taking, he turns away, wipes the blood from his buoy, returns it to its sheath, and once more, climbing into his saddle, rides off to rejoin the victorious colonists. On the ground where the engagement took place, a sad spectacle is presented. The smoke has drifted away, disclosing the corpses of the slain, horses as well as men. All the freebooters have fallen, and now lie a stretch as they fell to stab or shot, some on their backs, others with face downward, or doubled sideways, but all dead, gashed and gory, not a wounded man among them. For the colonists, recalling that parallel spectacle in the mission courtyard, have given loose rein to the lex talionis, and exacted a terrible retribution. Nor have they themselves got off unscathed. The desperados being refused quarter, fought it out to the bitter end, killing several of the settlers, and wounding many more, among the latter two known to us, Haywood and Dupre. By good fortune, neither badly, and both to recover from their wounds. The young Creole also recovering his stolen treasure, found secreted at the camp on Coyote Creek. Our tale might here close, for it is scarce necessary to record what came afterwards. The reader will guess, and correctly, that Dupre became the husband of Jesse, and Helen the wife of Clancy, both marriages being celebrated at the same time, and both with full consent and approval of the only living parent, Colonel Armstrong. And on the same day, though at a different hour, a third couple was made man and wife, Jupe getting spliced to his jewel from whom he had been so long cruelly kept apart. It is some years since then, and changes have taken place in the colony. As yet none to be regretted, but the reverse. A courthouse town has sprung up on the site of the ancient mission, the center of a district of plantations, the largest of them belonging to Louis Dupre, while one almost as extensive and equally as flourishing as Charles Clancy for owner. On the latter live Jupe and Jewel, Jupe overseer, Jewel at the head of the domestic department, while on the former reside two other personages presented in this tale, it is hoped with interest attached to them. They are Blue Bill and his Phoebe, not living alone, but in the midst of a numerous progeny of piccaninnies. How the coon hunter comes to be there requires explanation. A word will be sufficient. Ephraim Dark, stricken down by the disgrace brought upon him, has gone to his grave, and at the breaking up of his slave establishment, Blue Bill, with all his belongings, was purchased by Dupre and transported to his present home. This, not by any accident, but designedly, as a reward for his truthfulness with the courage he displayed in declaring it. Between the two plantations, lying contiguous, Colonel Armstrong comes and goes, scarce knowing which is his proper place of residence. In both he has a bedroom, and a table profusely spread with the warmest of welcomes. In the town itself is a market, plentifully supplied with provisions, especially big game, bear meat, and venison. Not strange, considering that it is catered for by four of the most skillful hunters in Texas. Their names, Woodley, Haywood, Hawkins, and Tucker. When off-duty, these worthies may be seen sauntering through the streets and relating the experiences of their latest hunting expedition. But there is one tale which Syme, the oldest of the quartet, has told over and over, yet never tires of telling. Need I say, it is the death shot. The End End of 87 End of The Death Shot by Thomas Maine Reed